Collector's Guild. Sorry, I want to use the whole title there. I am officially a member, so I'm so glad to be here on the channel talking about Forgotten Comics. And in today's episode, we're going to bring the world back to the Jurassic Age. Boy, seeing that develop further, we open with a gorilla being cybernetic Wait. origins. Of the question. It's likely in December of 1956. Wow. That's just wrong! Hiya friends, it's Comicade. Welcome to Forgotten Comics, where we talk about comics that have been forgotten throughout history and where they could be going today if continued today. This is episode 10, the finale of Forgotten Comics, where we are talking about the new wave. The new, the new wave. Back to the good old days of 1986, where this comic was first published by Eclipse Comics. We are talking about... The New Wave, written by Mindy Newell, penciled by Lee Weeks, and inked by Ty Templeton, to start. The series was published bi-weekly, until issue 9, when it switched up to being a full-sized comic book. Until issue 13, when it was cancelled. Through the first five issues, we are given this superhero team's origin, set on a space station where Cliff Pasternak, CEO of A Corporation, later we discover it's called the Sally Corporation, I- Sally! Sally! I don't know if they really had a name to begin with, but throughout the first issue and, and up, up until the, like, fifth or sixth issue, we don't even know what this corporation is or what they do. <laughs> At least I, I couldn't discover that. I I full hearted wholeheartedly read this first issue, and I had no idea what this corporation actually did. As I was saying, Cliff Pasternak, CEO of a corporation, the Sally Corporation, Sally! Sally was pulling strings to organize world domination that the rest of the scientists seemed to be unaware of. He uses James Holmes's teleportation booth. I. At, it's a booth that that goes that that can peek into other th it's a booth not even gonna pretend to understand what this booth is uh, he uses the booth to bring aboard a super being from another dimension which exhibits super strength and flight abilities much like Superman or the Sentry from Marvel Comics it cannot return home because the booth it came in is later destroyed the being is named Tachyon and forms a bond with James after being stranded in our dimension. I'm not sure if he named the being Tachyon or if it was just already named Tachyon. Really, in order to get a complete grasp of this series, I have to read it from start to finish all 13 issues, and it's incredibly wordy. I read maybe three issues of it, and I... Oh, uh, oh, so many words. So many words, not enough show, a little too much tell. That's my opinion, but I think if you read it, you'd agree. James and Cliff revealed to the others that this whole setup, whatever it is, or was, was to explore the possibility of other dimensions and alternate universes. Even though they got grants and stuff from the government to do other sort of, like, power supplies and stuff like that, the whole thing was really just to cover up to look into other dimensions. After trying to send Tachyon home, the chamber is destroyed, as I said, and Tachyon runs off in confusion. He actually puts a hole right through the ship and like people almost I think a couple people die <laughs> of course he was confused he didn't do it on purpose but you know people die eventually returning and bonding with James as I said the next few comics introduce us to these characters Avalon aka Lizzie the teenage daughter of a past female superhero past is in dead she died uh, not revealed how she died just yet. With power she doesn't completely understand, comparable to that of like the Scarlet Witch from Marvel Comics, except all that I saw her really do was make things shrink, or shrink out of existence. And Impulse, aka Danny, her next door neighbor, he has telekinesis and they like each other. In issue 3 we're introduced to the woman Polestar. She can use a pole. 
And yes, that's actually her name in this comic. Her real name is Morgan, and she wants to join her lover on the station. Along with a stowaway, a shrinking spy, her name is Dot, and she's comparable to that of the Wasp from Marvel Comics, except without wings. She even has little blasters, she can go bzz, 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 zapping, zap, zap. One of the robots on the station breaks his programming and decides to join the fight against the CEO, Cliff, with the rest of this strange bunch of people. Later on, we discover that he was actually a disabled boy turned into this machine by the CEO as a part of his plans to revamp the world. Dot was only supposed to scope out the station and report back, but when she discovered all this was going on with the others, she met up and they decided to work together to take down this greedy, evil CEO, Cliff. Once Cliff was defeated, they made a getaway in the shuttle. To be completely honest, it's like this comic was all over the place, trying to be everything all at once, and if you really liked it, that's great. I think it's fantastic that you did. And there are a lot of reasons to like this book. I think that it could have gone places if really a little bit more thought was put into it beforehand. But what we have here is pretty much a mishmash of everything in existence in one attempt. It doesn't work like that most of the time. Which could very well be the reason that the series didn't last and that the company Eclipse went downhill as it did. The series was cancelled after 13 issues as I said before, besides a two-part miniseries where the team fought another team called the Volunteers, in your choice of either 2D or 3D, which was a pretty neat gimmick at the time. I think that if this comic series were to come back today, the best way of telling it would be if the project to look into alternate realities wasn't really a secret from the crew of the space station. And instead, all that was a secret would be the CEO's alternative motive of world domination. The whole project could be for experiments on alternate realities where they snatched up super beings. And then one day, the station crashes down onto the earth and the super beings are set free among the people, good and evil alike all persecuted and most seeking a way back home. This I think would be a much more thrilling take and not the standard superhero team building story. The rights to all of Eclipse comics were acquired by Todd McFarlane who used a supporting character named Heap in the Spawn universe, but I wonder what else could be done with the new wave if reimagined over at Image Comics. To those willing to dive down the rabbit hole of the long overlooked and forgotten side of comic books, I say thank you for joining me. Consider watching through the previous episodes if you passed by any comic that could interest you. So in conclusion, what makes a comic book truly forgotten? Nothing except those who choose to move on and forget. Each and every comic book published has had an impact in popular culture and is a part of our history. Every story has a purpose for the readers in a time where it may have made perfect sense. Could be absolute nonsense today. Does that mean that they should be forgotten? No. Because there's nothing quite like a classic. And the classics are here to stay. Never forget Forgotten Comics. Silly.